I am thrilled to be here. This is an amazing book. I am so excited that everyone shares my enthusiasm for this amazing book. Um, I have put into the chat already how to, um, how to get um, autographed copies. So um, I'm Eve Kahn. I'm a board member of the Victorian Society's New York chapter. Um, I'm thrilled to, that so many people have come. Thank you. And thank you to the Prack Victorian Society team for making events like this draw crowds and, and proceed so seamlessly. Uh, quick housekeeping items. We have um, three more talks coming up. And, and Alexis can correct me if I get this wrong. Three more talks coming up. November 16th, uh, these are Zoom evening lectures, uh, two fascinating books about um, slavery and resistance in 19th century New York. December 9th is um, a talk on the first biography of Eliza Greatorex, the first, uh, the second woman to be allowed to join the National Academy of Design, great 19th century painter who documented ye old New York as it was vanishing in the mid 19th century. And on December 17th, a gorgeously illustrated lecture by Emily Orr of the Kerber Hewitt Museum, gorgeously moderated by Caroline O'Connell, also of the Cooper Hewitt Museum, on the history of New York department stores. So please join me in welcoming Ron Coddington, who has been collecting 19th century photographs since his teenage years in central New Jersey. Um, he has homed in on carte de visite, which is going to be the subject of an upcoming book by him, which was an affordable paper photograph format popularized in the 1860s. He has devoted years to researching the people, especially soldiers who posed for those images, the sweep of American humanity in all its flaws and grandeur. Among his professional titles in recent years, has been columnist for publications including the New York Times, Civil War News. Um, he's based in Arlington, Virginia and serves as editor and publisher of the quarterly magazine, Military Images, of which I collect vintage copies, um, <laughs> and uh, an editor for the Chronicle of Higher Education and the Chronicle of Philanthropy. What I know him best for, and um, among many things I admire him for, is this five volume series that he has completed for Johns Hopkins University Press about um, the faces of participants in the Civil War. Um, I sent you a link, you can get autographed copies, and I highly recommend the entire series. These are humble photographs of people posing, sometimes stiltedly sometimes for the only photograph taken of them in their lives. Um, and Ron gorgeously explains what we know and don't know about them and um, why they matter. And um, let's see, he's done Union and Confederate Soldiers, which is two volumes, um, African Americans who battled for the Union cause um, while battling bitter prejudice, uh, Union and Confederate Sailors was one volume, and then the final book is this tonight's topic, Civil War Nurses. And uh, yeah, it's um, heart-wrenching and gorgeous and uh, magisterial research, researched with 763 footnotes at last count. <laughs> and I'm gonna let him talk about these diverse and brave women who risk their lives to try and heal some wounds of war. And um, this is a time, he is writing about a time of bitter political divisiveness and violence and civilian deaths and rampant disease and wisps of hope that is in many ways not different from 2020. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ron Coddington to the Victorian Society Zoom stage. Take it away. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Eve, thank you so very much for making this possible. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled. I've loved chatting with you, and I, I know we'll continue to stay in touch. Uh, uh, the rest of the Victorian society, including Franklin, the voice of God, <laughs> uh, thank you. And of course, thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, I think in addition to what Eve said about the political times that we currently live in and how that is uh, something that the Civil War generation lived with. Uh, there's two other, um, uh, two other moments that we could be thinking about. One of them is Veterans Day, um, which is today, and um, uh, the nurses, some of which, some of whom you'll meet this evening, uh, certainly uh, did their share as, uh, as caregivers and as relief workers uh, on par with anyone, um, their patriotism and their contributions and sacrifice uh, second to none. Um, also important, uh, at least I think about this as being the year of nurses uh, in many ways because of the current pandemic that we're uh, part of. And um, uh, when I 
look at the news uh, and consume it and uh, read all these stories of those who are working behind the lines to make sure that uh, they're trying to keep this pandemic contained. I think of these women from the 1860s uh, and I strongly suspect they would have been right in there and uh, contributing and giving everything that they had. So um, uh, with that, tonight I'm gonna talk uh, just a, a little bit of an overview about a, a couple of important points, I think, about uh, nurses. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about photography, uh, the carte de visite, as, as Eve referenced, and um, how that's an important part of the story. And then I'll introduce you to a few of the nurses uh, that I met during the course of my research and um, give you a flavor of what they were all about. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. And I'm thinking that all of you can see this. Uh, and um, I think really a good place to start is going to be with the image that's on the cover. Uh, in many ways, Marie Tepe or Marie Brose Tepe Leonard, uh, her full name, is uh, uh, sort of represents the definition or the expansiveness of coming up with a definition of what the nurse was during the war. Um, uh, Marie is technically a vivandier. Um, she was attached to a regiment. Some of you may know her story. Uh, and um, she might not be exactly who you think about when you imagine a Civil War nurse. Perhaps she may be, uh, but she's one of a smaller number, a uh, smaller number of women who attach themselves, in her case, uh, through a husband uh, that became involved with a regiment. Um, others became involved through sons, through husbands, but she's a particular, um, in a particular unique smaller group uh, that definitely provided care for soldiers. Um, that group I've labeled freelancers uh, because they weren't really beholding to uh, a society, um, uh, a certain organization. They weren't necessarily army nurses. Uh, they were just on their own. They might get supplies from home, uh, from their hometowns. As I reference here, um, Vivandier's mother of the regiment, daughter of the regiment. Uh, these individuals were just sort of involved directly with a particular regiment. The much larger uh, group are the um, paid and volunteer nurses. And um, I've used and found different names for them, nurse, matron, relief worker, caregiver. There's no real standardization. Nurse is probably the most common term, but it's not always used. In the Confederate States, uh, your nurses were basically in the army or they were part of local and state charities. And that's about as far as it went. As you might imagine, nurses in the Confederate States face um, many of the same challenges that soldiers did. Uh, the economy was um, eventually falling apart. Um, the territory was being taken over by Union forces. Uh, there were civil problems going on. So mustering the kind of strength to form national organizations was just not within the scope of what would happen in the southern states. In the U.S., in the Union, you definitely have the Army nurses and very involved local and state charities. You also have the Christian Commission, which is a hugely powerful philanthropy. And then you've got the combination of the U.S. Sanitary Commission and the Western Sanitary Commission. Those last three named organizations uh, are 
powerhouses of organization. Uh, they are fueling the purchase of supplies, pouring money. Um, some of you may have seen the images of the sanitary fairs that they use to raise money. Um, images were sold to support those uh, philanthropic efforts. So as you can see by these uh, circles, you've got a much a big and powerful uh, influence that's happening in the North to provide for the soldiers and to fund nurses or fund organizations to have volunteers to participate. I also want to spend just a moment. Uh, one of the common questions, uh, maybe perhaps not for you all, but one that I got along the way is, well, what's the nursing uniform? Uh, what did they wear? And of course, there really isn't, uh, uh, I should say the closest you might come to a prescribed uniform is Dorothea Dix. Uh, and when she puts out her guidelines for nurses, um, uh, she wants a certain age, she wants you basically to dress in a quiet fashion, um, no flashy clothes, no bright colors. And, um, but outside of that, there's some tolerance for a variety. So Marie um, Tepe wearing her um, uh, improvised uniform that's based on the French styles. You might see that um, connected with a nurse. The woman next to her is Helen Gilson. And Helen is probably, uh, of these four individuals, Helen is probably dressed the closest to what Dorothy and Dix would look, uh, she, she would approve, I think, of Helen's uh, outfit. Um, next to her is Mary Morris' husband. I'll talk a little bit about Mary and Helen later on. Uh, Mary has gone a step further to customize her uh, uniform or her outfit by adding an apron that she designed. There is a custom made wide pocket in the front uh, to hold all the goodies that she was dispensing as she moved throughout the wards. Uh, no surprise that uh, her pocket full of miracles uh, entertained and got all the, the soldiers, the pens, the pencils, the writing materials, anything that they needed, the books, newspapers, anything they wanted. Uh, and then we have a, uh, a Catholic nun, a sister on the right, uh, wearing your habits, your religious garb, would also be fairly common during that time period. So um, if you were on the streets of New York or Washington, you're not going to see a group of nurses walk by and, and go, oh, there's a bunch of nurses. Chances are you would not know. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is in all, uh, almost 80 women that I've researched, there's 77 in the book, which is consistent with my other volumes, um, not one of them mentioned this individual, uh, which seems, I guess, on the surface, a little, it's a little surprising that no one said, oh, I learned this from reading Florence Nightingale's book. No references uh, to it. And, uh, but of course, she sort of, she looms large in, in all of this. I love this quote that is in her, I believe it was published in 1859. Uh, every woman, or at least almost every woman in England, has at one time or another of her life charge of the personal health of somebody, whether a child or invalid. In other words, every woman is a nurse. She, of course, writes this based on her experiences during the Crimean War in the early to mid 1850s. Uh, would love to find a photograph of her uh, out on the field. The closest I could come is this image of a Mrs. Rogers. Gives you a sense of what's going on. Um, I wanted to get a sense of, uh, since the American women that I researched were not talking about Florence Nightingale. I thought it would come at this a different way. I did a survey of newspapers, American newspaper mentions between 1854 and uh, the end of the war, 1865. And um, granted, this is sort of a limited data set because newspapers are coming online um, and I'm not able to necessarily 
um, get access to some regions that might not be represented. So, but during this time period, um, I found uh, almost 7,200 references of Florence Nightingale. And um, you'll see her Crimean War profile picks up in the 50s. It uh, drops off a little bit, and then uh, after her book comes out in 59, uh, you see uh, in 1860, a thousand mentions of her in newspapers. So somebody, <coughs> somebody, uh, some individuals were clearly reading about her. The word was getting out. Uh, and one of my uh, favorite quotes in the 1860 edition, which is published in America, I believe in Boston, um, she adds uh, this interesting detail that I think perhaps motivated women during the Civil War. She says, surely if there was heroism in dashing up the heights of Alma, seeking glory at the cannon's mouth in defiance of death, and of all mortal opposition amid the shouts of the victors and the cries of the vanquished. There was heroism unparalleled and calmly volunteering to minister to the fever stricken and the dying. So this biographical sketch is introducing her to the American public. Um, this note, um, which plays off of her other writings, I think must have had some traction with uh, women in 1861. And in fact, if you begin to look at some of the women um, uh, that I researched, you find out that um, they certainly saw the noble purpose of what they were doing and equated it on par with what Florence Nightingale had done and also combining that with the reform movements happening in the earlier part of the century. Uh, no surprise that uh, they're running up uh, against trouble as uh, Georgiana or Georgie Bacon is discussing. She's making this comment here about running into uh, the wrath of surgeons who really don't want any part of women um, in the field or in the hospital. And uh, uh, Georgie is not unusual in um, taking a proactive stance to defeat this, uh, I think she calls it an annoyance uh, at one point, um, but she says that we must create the position that we wish to occupy is, the, is sort of this, the sense of what's going on here. And uh, in that, I think there's a lot of commonality with the independence that uh, Florence Nightingale is promoting through her works. Clara Barton, of course, is more or less saying the same thing here uh, when she's talking about um, the battlefield, making the comparison of the battlefield to what, uh, what women can do in their role as nurses. There's clearly no difference. Clara Barton echoing the comments of Florence Nightingale, putting it in her own words, for sure. So, um, Maybe a surprise, maybe not, that um, I did not write individual profiles of Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix. They're, they're so well known. There's so much that has been written about them, and they're referenced so many times throughout the book. Uh, it didn't seem necessary to dedicate profiles to them when I could be doing more to profile some of the women whose names that you don't know, those who have been forgotten in the spirit of what Clara Barton was saying, that unforgotten part of the war. So they're definitely, Clara Barton and Dorothea Dix are, are very much present throughout the book. They influenced, they had their influence over the events, but uh, I decided to let them, uh, let them be. <laughs> Um, a little bit about the photography. Fair to say um, that uh, this group of individuals is part of the photography generation. It's only 22 years old in 1861. Um, just to give you a quick sense of uh, when photography, when the announcement was made in late 1839, Abraham Lincoln is 30, Frederick Douglass 21, Clara Barton is 18, U.S. Grant is 17, 
your average Civil War soldier is four. Uh, George Armstrong Custer is the baby of the group. Uh, really the only one of this group to spend his entire life uh, in photography, which I like to think must have touched him in some way. He certainly understood the power of photography uh, in his imagery and as part of his identity and part of his brand. Daguerre, of course, he's the, uh, he's, he's, he's the big headliner. Um, he's, working, uh, he's, he's working on top of other individuals, the fascination with phosphorus chemicals, the fascination with the camera obscura, creating a commercially successful photography process. Um, just great stuff in 1839. Virtually has a monopoly um, on photography uh, for two decades. Uh, in the mid-50s, there's this growing realization that photography can really be a powerful instrument. Um, it uh, can be used for your identity. It can be used, hey, it can be used on your, your visiting card. Um, jokes are made about it, but some folks begin to take all of this serious and they begin to realize the utility of photography. Rather than the artful portrait, you can actually do a bunch of things with photography. Um, it, it's an enabler to do business um, and on top of art and a number of other um, uh, promising ventures. Desdary, He's the one who patents this camera that has a number of lenses. This is a four lens version. And uh, the idea is incredibly simple in terms of today's uh, thinking. Um, you can make four prints on a plate, cut them out, put them on uh, uh, Bristol board mounts and hand them out to your friends. It's a simple idea. Of course, it doesn't really take off. Um, this is not something that folks think it's kind of novel, interesting. But for a few years, the idea gets a little bit of interest, but it doesn't really take off until 1859 in the spring in Paris. Uh, the emperor, Napoleon III, and Eugenie, uh, they step into uh, a Paris studio and order up a bunch of cartes de visite. And of course, everyone in Paris wants to copy the royals and they have their uh, images made in the carte de visite format. The following summer, 1860, the same thing plays out in London. Um, all the rage, the carte de visite is now gathering a lot of steam. Um, it's already in America, but between January and March of 61, you begin to see advertisements um, for the carte de visite. Also, uh, very soon being called the card photograph, um, being billed in part as a, um, as a way to copy the daguerreotypes, which uh, the photographers are telling us are soon going to decay. So take your old daguerreotype and get it reprinted as a carte de visite. Great irony for those of you know, who know photography is the daguerreotype has stood up wonderfully to the test of time, uh, and uh, the carte de visite, not so much. Cardomania, a real term, um, not one that I made up for this book or for this presentation. Uh, cardomania sweeps the country um, by uh, 1860. Well, I'll give you a, a, a chart in a few minutes so we can take a look at that. Um, the excitement and the enthusiasm about these images is really because they're, they're precious items, they're personal items, they're intimate items. These are the sorts of photographs that you can hold in your hand, you can keep them in the parlor, you can gossip about them, uh, you can get emotional, you can laugh at the faces. It, it, they, they, are, um, they are a wonderful um, object that inspires families and friends to have. They're affordable. You can get a dozen for $1.50. Um, a tintype would cost you probably about 50 cents at the time. So you can get a bunch of these images at a cheap price. They're reproducible. You buy a dozen, um, you hand them out to your friends, you go to the same photographer, 
and order more. Uh, your photographer will get out the glass plate and make another set of copies. And then of course, shareable. The more you buy, the more you share with your friends. Also, personalization. Uh, daguerreotypes, and then I mentioned tintypes, and I didn't mention ambrotypes, uh, which are the other two hard plate formats, uh, glass and iron, that came up in the late 1850s. It was really hard to personalize them. You'd have to tuck a note inside the back of the case that they were housed in, um, but a carte de visite, just turn them around on the back and write your note on the back. Another important point for, I think, Americans in particular, this idea of democratization. We can be sitting in a parlor right now, um, or on Zoom, and uh, your photo can be sitting right next to, fill in the blank, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, um, anyone you want, that power of being on the same plane as a famous person, um, whoever they may be. Uh, there's a power in that. There's an equalization that goes on. That democratization, I believe, is really part of their attraction. Of course, you've got to have a place to put all of these images. So photo albums come as a result of this. And really, we're looking at the Facebook of the 1860s. You have a massive media movement going on, uh, the telegraph trains, newspapers, magazines, printing technologies, photography now democratized to the carte de visite. Uh, and for everything that I said over the last few minutes, it is the social media of the 1860s. These cartes de visite are the social media. The chart that I mentioned, uh, just to give you a sense of how it takes off, the Civil War years are really a time um, of, of change in terms of photo technology. The daguerreotype by 1861 is really on a decline. And if you follow the green bar, you'll see how the daguerreotype is really um, uh, dropped in popularity by 1865. Ambrotypes, uh, meanwhile, are the number one, the gold bars, they're number one in 1861, but they gradually begin to slide down. Tintypes remain curiously at a low point throughout the Civil War years. I believe this is because tintypes suffer from a branding problem. Um, they're really not known as tintypes until after the war. Uh, those of you who know the early history of tintypes, uh, they're known as melanotypes, ferrotypes. These terms don't seem to really catch on in terms of advertisements, so not quite as much referenced. The red bars, the cartes de visite, uh, of course you can see their trajectory uh, from very humble beginnings in 1861 to market domination by 1865. This chart supports uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great uh, American uh, letters author, uh, man of letters. Uh, this is an often quoted, if, if folks know the carte de visite, they know this, this, this quote has survived time. Um, card portraits have become the social currency, the sentimental greenbacks of civilization. With the numbers here, uh, England alone, according to William C. Dara and his uh, carte de visite in, 19th century, uh, in the 19th century, um, he says in England alone, 300 to 400 million carts de visite were sold every year uh, between 1861 and 1867. I did a little math, uh, some calculations to get a sense of what those numbers might have looked like in the United States. So I took Union soldiers uh, as my basis, 2.5 million men, um, and uh, figured a bunch of them had their photos made early on, posed during the middle of the war, and if they survived, maybe a last photo. Some may have had less, some may have more. I um, averaged all that out and came up with a number of 40 million uh, images. And just to make sure you're aware, I'm not talking about the mass-produced carts de visite 
of generals and politicians and celebrities. This is only the soldiers. And I think this number makes sense compared to Dara's large numbers uh, for England. If only 10% of these images survived, uh, you're looking at 4 million uh, carts to visit that are out there today. And that sounds like a big number until you realize uh, that every two minutes, um, we're gonna take as many photos as existed in the entire 19th century. So sounds like a lot, and it is, um, but uh, not so much as you might think. What was left behind, the, those images that survived, paint a portrait of America and a portrait of women as they're going through this great period of change as well. Uh, and I have to show off just a few of these, uh, of these images. Women involved in exercise, which is a craze sweeping the nation around that time. Um, you've got uh, a group of milliners on the back porch of uh, what I assume is a small manufactory in Corning, New York. Uh, you have this woman seated with her hands uh, folded, uh, looking slightly, uh, glancing slightly away from the camera. Um, you have these two women just in a, a lovely moment surrounded by ivy. And um, a simple image of a woman in bed, the simple inscription on the back, 101 years. They speak so much for the time period. And um, I, it's really, I, I feel like it's really important to recognize these images with it, which are often thought of as part of vernacular photography, wedged in there between the daguerreotype and then all the exciting photo technologies of the latter part of the century. Um, there's a little niche here where the carts de visite sits, and um, I want you all to remember them. <laughs> now, I'll spend the rest, of the, uh, uh, the rest of the presentation just introducing you to a few of the individuals that are in the book. And the goal here is just to give you a little sampling. Um, when you look at these images and see the faces, um, and for purposes of the book, um, my criteria was wartime identified, uh, absolute airtight identified images of women. Um, and I wanted to actually know that the original ex image existed. I was not picking images out of books that were reproduced later. I was working with collectors, uh, private collectors and public and private museums to identify what they had. Um, I wound up gathering about 130 images altogether. About 25 of those images, I was unable to complete the basic timeline of their life which is to say, at some point along the way, um, I was unable to establish a death date, or I was unable to track them at a certain point in their life, which raised questions about what I thought might be uh, an airtight identity. So a bunch of those individuals moved out, and of the hundred or so that were left, um, I chose the eventual group of 77 for the book. Um, so we'll start with uh, uh, Almira Fowles. Um, had the Civil War not happened, um, her claim to fame might have been that she was Clara Barton's landlady in the mid 1850s. Um, uh, but uh, she um, had a long journey through several husbands that died from New York to Ohio to uh, Washington. Uh, after Lincoln was elected, she began to collect lint and collect materials to make bandages and frenetically went about this business to the point where it alarmed her friends uh, and they questioned her sanity, not realizing that she knew that Lincoln's election was going to ignite something that was far beyond the control 
of her and most uh, all Americans. So uh, she called it early on. And um, I particularly am enamored with this photograph because of the number of accounts that I found that describe nurses carrying baskets full of supplies. And so um, I, I'm not exactly sure what she has in these baskets, um, but uh, I can imagine her walking through the hospitals of Washington with them. I love this portrait just for the, um, the casual nature, the organic feel for the pose. It's not, um, it, it's very unlike your stiffly posed uh, cast iron neck brace um, image. Sally Dysert is uh, here on the left with two of her other, uh, which would become fellow nurses. And um, she happened to be uh, in Harrisburg, an educated woman. She's in Harrisburg at the, uh, as Lincoln is coming through uh, town by rail for his inauguration. And she is so taken by Lincoln's presence. Uh, she says, all that was good was with him. There was no bad. And in that moment, she is inspired to contribute what she can to the cause. And for her, that meant becoming a nurse. Uh, Catherine Lawrence, Kit Lawrence, she's representative of uh, during those heady days in the 1830s and 1840s when the re reform movements are gaining steam. Um, She's no nonsense. Uh, she's telling it like it is. Uh, she stands up for any reform movement that you can name of the time period. She's involved. Uh, she is a hardcore activist. She comes to Washington after the uh, Dorothy, in answer to Dorothea Dix's request, her call for nurses, and she and Dorothea butt heads. Uh, Dorothea shunts um, Kit off to some of the worst hospitals in DC. And of course, Kit is going to uh, fight her way through all of this along the way as a result of being shunted off to these secondary hospitals. Um, she is on the receiving end of um, uh, uh, slaves who are escaping from Northern Virginia and other parts of the South. And um, one of those, in one of those refugee groups are three young girls who appear to be more white than black, including Rebecca, who you see Kit pictured with here. And um, Kit basically adopts Rebecca and her sisters, goes on a speaking tour. Um, it's fairly, it becomes fairly publicized. She sells this image. Uh, later to raise money to travel across the North to tell her story in support of uh, the abolition of slavery. Uh, Mary Jane Safford is on the extreme, sort of on the opposite end of, of Kit Lawrence. She has uh, no experience, there's no record of her being involved in activism. She's, a, she's basically a teenager. Uh, and there's this wonderful description of her on the battlefield of Perryville, Kentucky in 1861. She's walking with a black man. She's carrying a, an improvised flag made of a rag on a pole. She has no idea of how to be a nurse or really what a nurse is, but she's out there with a man who has a basket of food and they're trying to help these soldiers who are left on the battlefield. And based on the strength of that experience, she winds up uh, returning to her home base in Cairo, uh, Illinois, which is how she gets the name the Cairo Angel. And like many women, she works herself to exhaustion. There is no such thing as furloughs. You just work until you're done. Um, by 1862, her brother, uh, who is a, has made a, 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 a fortune for himself in business, sends Mary Jane to Europe where she spends the rest of the war to recover her health. Uh, Anna Marie Ross, not as fortunate, did not have a wealthy um, brother. Um, she was in Philadelphia, pours her heart 
and her soul into helping build a hospital um, in Philadelphia. And during the course of this, establishes the hospital uh, uh, on December 23rd, or pardon me, 22nd of 1863, the hospital is dedicated. And everyone there who contributed to it is present, except for Anna Marie, who lay dying um, in her home because she had worked herself to absolute exhaustion. Uh, Mary Morris' husband, I talked about her a little bit earlier, her pocket pockets uh, full of miracles. Um, she joins, uh, she attaches herself to an Army Corps hospital, and you can see the Corps badge on her straw hat, um, her self-designed apron, her self-designed hat. Um, she um, is a part of the relief um, group that heads to Antietam after the battle, and um, she um, shares a more or less a double wide tent with another nurse and she fashions a um, medicine bottle out of red calico and hangs that from the top of the tent to let soldiers that are passing by know that this is a station where they can receive medicine and care. Uh, the big story that you may know her for is later on she becomes very active in petitioning uh, Abraham Lincoln for clemency for soldiers uh, who were convicted and sentenced to execution. And many folks know uh, of Lincoln's leniency, but few understand that his leniency, certainly uh, Mary Morris' husband, had a lot to do with helping him understand the plight of those soldiers. Uh, Helen Louise Gilson, um, she's sort of a um, She's uh, in some ways a very independent spirit. She's working back and forth um, with her hometown in Massachusetts to deliver supplies. Um, what I think is terrific about her is in 1864, after the Battle of the Crater, when US colored troops, these black men in blue, came back, they gathered uh, in an open space uh, out in the country, and none of the white nurses uh, or white doctors would have anything to do with them. Uh, and they were left in the care of whatever surgeons were attached to their regiments, except for Helen. Um, she basically said, these men need our care. Um, I can't leave them alone. And so she, by herself, goes in there and helps um, organize the camp um, help get the supply, the flow of supplies coming in, and other medical needs and personnel um, eventually come to the aid of these men. Uh, Felicia Ann Grundy is uh, described in uh, in a number of places as second to no woman, women in the women in the South. Um, she's in Nashville um, uh, during the war, both before Union occupation and after Union occupation. Um, important to know that she's the, the only individual I could find in the South who made an effort to form a national organization, which might have been on the scale of one of, of Dorothea Dix's establishment or could have possibly been on the scale of one of the sanitary commissions, um, but for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, not able to put together the, uh, the money and the human power to make that happen. Uh, Sister Ignatius Farley, uh, who I also mentioned earlier, in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, her church, um, her Catholic church, becomes a hospital and um, she and her sister nurses all become caregivers. And there's a moment, I'm gonna read you this, uh, where she's um, in the, the sanctuary and she wanders over to one of the rooms off of the sanctuary where all of her fellow sisters are sleeping. 
and she says, I stood fascinated by the unusual picture of seven professed sisters worn out from severe hospital duty who were lying asleep on the floor in soldier fashion. Each sister was enfolded in a blanket while each weary head was resting upon a pillow made of leaves gathered on the campus. Over the sleeping group, which included the superior Mother de Chantal, there rested the soft, roseate glow from the sanctuary lamp gleaming through the glass panels of the closed door and still lingering the delicate fragrance of the incense, of the incense used in the adjoining chapel for an evening benediction. Another religious woman, Sybil Jones, she's really a superstar. Uh, before the war, she and her husband, um, Quakers, are traveling uh, the world, traveling the globe um, to evangelize. And um, when the war comes, she is clearly on the side of the friends with not wanting to become involved. Her son, however, has a different idea, and he casts his lot with the Union Army the friction between the family as a result of all of this is uh, difficult, but they eventually bridge it and they're sharing letters during the war until his death uh, in, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. in 1864. His death prompts her to go on a new tour as a nurse. Uh, the last... Um, individual I want you to meet tonight is uh, Rosanna Billing. And um, she's, um, uh, her story is similar in many ways to others that I researched. Um, frail in health, um, parents who did not want her to go. Um, they worried, they feared for her life. Um, she, of course, felt this duty and um, was going to go without their permission. This is an oft-repeated story. And uh, she winds up being part of uh, hospitals in Falls Church, Fredericksburg, winds up in Annapolis uh, at the Navy School, which was abandoned um, during the Civil War to the Union, Union hospitals. And um, she contracts typhus in January of 1865 after she's been caring for Andersonville survivors who are coming in. So she's seen the worst that war has to, that can bring to a country, and um, she succumbs to typhus. And um, one of the male nurses, a name that you know, um, gets wind of this. He hears about, uh, about this individual whom he had never met, and um, he makes a note of her passing. So here's what Walt Whitman has to say. Um, a lady named Mr. Mrs. Billing, who has long been a practical friend of soldiers, a nurse in the army, and had become attached to it in a way that no one can realize but him or her who has had the experience, was taken sick early this winter, lingered some time, and finally died in the hospital. It was her request that she should be buried among the soldiers and after the military method. Her coffin was carried to the grave by soldiers with the usual military escort, buried and a salute fired over the grave. This was at Annapolis a few days since. So, thank you. Absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I think as you said the other day, on Zoom, um, I, yes, I'm agreeing with you that I'm a better person for having known these ladies. Yeah, right? I, I really, I really, I, I was so inspired um, by them, and um, they make me reflect on um, on my everyday actions. They really do. Yeah, um, we have a ton of questions. Do you, you got some time? You're okay. I'm, 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 I'm here for the duration. Okay, no, <laughs> I'd love it. Okay, so Leonard Berg asks two questions. Were there Navy specialty nurses? And who did treat in general the African-American troops? Did they have, I, I, I know you said you couldn't find a name attached to an African-American nurse, but there must have been African-American physicians for those separate regiments. How did that work? 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Leonard, thanks for, thanks for the questions. Uh, as far as the Navy is concerned, um, there was a number of women who served on transports and um, uh, those transport ports are all over the um, waterways of the country, both the oceans and the rivers. And so certainly, um, certainly having a presence there. Um, I found no presence of any woman on a ship, uh, on a ship that was stationed um, at sea, for example. Um, but certainly a large number. In fact, a number of women seem to get their start on transports um, for relatively short periods of time on rescue missions, and then they move um, into uh, more of a, a land nursing assignment, I guess you would say. Um, as for the African Americans, um, you have a, a, a dynamic for the majority of the war that those black regiments are going to be officered by white men. Um, by the end of the war, that begins to change. So you have um, uh, some cases of um, African-American surgeons who begin to join the regiments uh, and chaplains also, um, and a very few line officers in literally the closing days and weeks of the war. Um, so they, they did have care, they did have supplies, and there were a number of African-American women, um, spouses, sisters, um, uh, daughters, that, um, that, that involved themselves the same way that the white nurses did. Uh, yes. Um, you don't know her name, right? Yeah, she, she is, uh, her name is not known and um, I was unable to, to track her. There are a number of post-war, some, some small number of post-war images of African-American women um, who were nurses, but they didn't meet my criteria. Well, one of the things that happened with my African-American book is since then, so many images, I, I struggled for the better part of two and a half years to find the images. And there were many times when I thought I couldn't do it. Um, and after the book came out, an unbelievable number of images came out. So I am really hopeful that this book is going to have the same effect here because we need to learn more about, uh, about those individuals. Right, a few years ago we were on a, but Ron and I was moderating a panel with yeah. Ron at the Historical Society, now the Center for Brooklyn History, and yeah. People got up at the end of that panel and I was literally going to cry because they said, you know, we have just figured out X about my great grandfather or, you know, and then I'm realizing that Ron is helping someone direct them to the National Archives, the exact spot where they can find their, their forebears um, records. Just really, really, really moving. I'll be really curious to see what surfaces. Oh, someone asks, um, Frederick Law Olmsted ran the Sanitary Commission. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, and um, he, um, I, I, think, I, think, I think I may have mentioned him once or twice. Uh, he's, he's too big of a player um, for, for this. Um, he's, he's sort of up there calling events uh, and um, directing things and making, making, uh, making decisions. So um, he's, he's sort of not, he's not really a direct part of the book, but certainly the decisions uh, that he had and his influence um, certainly affected um, all of the women in different ways. And um, Rose Connolly is thrilled that you mentioned the nuns because they often don't get incorporated into the story, right? Did you yeah. find that, that you were one of, you know, was it a rare example of documenting that angle? Uh, yes, um, a number of nuns served and I, 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 I am embarrassed to say I don't remember the full uh, number, but uh, a significant number. And um, uh, it was, I, I wanted to be able to document women of faith who were part of this movement. Um, and I did put a special effort into seeking out such images. And so, you know, you, you saw, um, you know, you heard her story, um, uh, Sybil Jones's story. And there's others, uh, others as well. And I, I would argue that they were uh, quite well suited, I think, for the work because of that evangelistic spirit 
um, being sent to um, different cities to establish orphanages or hospitals or places of, uh, of other caregiving places. Um, they came in with some experience and you certainly see evidence of that in their actions. Right, and they don't have a disapproving husband and... and uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no baggage. <laughs> already, right, and they've already declared some independence from their family by joining an order in the first place. And right. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, but so many, and it's not confined to the, the women of faith, um, the independent spirit of so many um, of the individuals. You have to keep in mind that um, for, for a man, you have a clear path, which is to go to your local enlistment center, sign up, get assigned a rank, you get a uniform, you join a company. That's not, that's early on in particular, the paths for women are, they're, they're not easy to understand. Um, and they eventually get a little bit better thanks to the work of folks like Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, but that all is a work in progress. You know, because right, some of them had already been abolitionists and they already had some experience organizing groups and meetings and right, some of them had already laid that groundwork and then they went on to become suffrage fighters and, and physicians. Uh, yeah, yes, Af after the war, uh, I, I, uh, I think eight um, of the women that I read about went into either became doctors or studied to become a doctor became involved in the suffrage movement. And early on, I was getting a sense that um, uh, some of the women that were more active saw the Civil War as an interruption. Um, but I think they quickly come to realize that, oh my gosh, this is an opportunity to really get involved and to make some ground, uh, to make some headway on, uh, on things that have been going on back home for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Right. And some of them, I think, went overseas and tried to improve conditions there in some cases. Yeah, there's no, um, the, the, um, uh, the sense of the spirit of wanderlust that inspires uh, after the war. You know, they get a taste of, 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 of this freedom and this independence, of course, balanced against the most horrible of circumstances um, of disease and death on a scale that is... Um, uh, you know, we've never experienced before or since. Yeah. Um, and so they certainly, uh, on the receiving end of so much of that, um, yeah, after the war, they're inspired to go on. And, uh, they, and, and very, very rare when um, one of the nurses sort of faded back into society. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in almost every case, they went on to something bigger and better. And, and this, this is important because um, my, the group of women that I researched is based on their photographs. So it's really random. And so to find that much activism after the war in what amounts to a random, random sampling of 77 women based on their photographs uh, speaks to something. So we got two questions about two specific people. I think they're going to have to email you about this, uh -oh. right? Somebody asked specifically about Mary Ann Taylor. Somebody asked specifically about Nellie Chase. I don't know if those, 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 I don't see them profiled in the book and they'll have to email yeah. you. Yeah, we, we, we can certainly talk uh, offline. As I mentioned at one point during the talk, um, I have researched a number of other um, individuals and I, uh, I wanted to be able to tell uh, the larger story of their contributions and their experience. And so that led me to include some folks or that names that you might know, um, but leave out others that you might know for various reasons because their stories might be a little bit redundant. And Louisa May Alcott was a nurse. Do we have any images of her or? Uh, I did not uh, include her. Um, of course, she's a nurse for a short period of time and writes, writes about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's definitely part of that. Her, 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 um, uh, her contribution, her involvement is, um, you know, is, is small, but it's significant because of the contribution she makes uh, in her writing uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. and I tended to, oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead, go ahead, finish up, yeah. Uh, no, no, go ahead. Um, Dorothy Poole asks, what kinds of repositories did you search 
for photos in addition to eBay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was really... But there, yeah, there was, a handful of collect, private collectors who love this material. Yeah, uh, there, one collector in particular, um, Chris Ford, who is a nurse, um, shared a 3,000 plus items in his collection with me, um, various ephemera and uh, a number of images. And um, a lot of Chris's photographs have now gone to the Library of Congress. Uh, but Chris came over my house with a big plastic bucket. <laughs> I started pulling out these original photographs, uh, almost half of which are in the book. And so uh, you can imagine that experience, um, that wealth of history in a plastic bucket in the hands of a private collector. Um, uh, wonderful um, for him to dedicate such a big part of his life to doing that. Um, that is an, an unusual circumstance. Um, the museums, uh, uh, certainly the Library of Congress had a few other images that I was able to use. Um, the uh, um, Carlisle Barracks, uh, Pennsylvania, the U.S. Army um, Heritage and Education Center, they have the um, collection of the Mollus, the, the Mollus Mass Collection. It's the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the American something. I can't remember the whole thing right now. Uh, but um, they have a nurses section, which uh, a lot of folks seem to have passed over. And uh, so that was a great resource for original images. And then of course, the, the community of private collectors, um, you've got such, in addition to Chris, all these individuals who are so passionate about these images that have really only come into a collector's marketplace after the centennial of the Civil War. So they've only been out there since the 1960s and some of them have found their way to museums, but the vast majority of those four million plus images are still in the hands of people like me um, who obsess over every detail. <laughs> Sometimes I'll buy a photo on eBay and it'll literally say on the back something like, this is important, it's your grandfather. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> trail snaps right there. This is important. Yes. And then of course people like me is like, well, I want to find out who the grandfather was. And then we go off down rabbit re research rabbit holes. <laughs> so, so can you briefly explain, there, there were photographers who came to the battlefields in some cases, who came to the hospitals. Can you explain the mechanics of that? Sure, sure. Um, you have, uh, um, there's really a couple different ways that this would happen. Um, your hometown photographer, well, let me say it a slightly different way. Your hometown raises a regiment uh, of a thousand men and they all, of course, in New York City, you've got a bunch of regiments. Um, and they all go to Virginia and Tennessee. Uh, and as they're invading the southern states and capturing territory, they're fighting, but they're also in, camp in encampments and camping out. So um, photographers will go from their hometowns and they will go to those camps um, in the southern states and get permission from the brigade commander or a division commander to set up shop. And so they will, of course, have an endless line of business. It, it's not all in the spirit of preserving the war. This is money. There's, there's cash to be made here. So they're taking all these photographs. Uh, there's wonderful images of these tent studios um, with portraits, examples of the photographer's work hanging outside. Um, soldiers would line up and have their images made. Um, you also have official contract photographers. And this is uh, the most formal contracting is done with the Army of the Potomac, which is the, 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 perhaps the best known of the Union Army, certainly in Virginia, centered in Virginia for the bulk of the war, with the notable exceptions of Antietam and Gettysburg. Uh, and so they're contracting, they're allowing photographers to come in and set up shop. The Army also has relationships with photographers to actually document war scenes. The Matthew Brady's, the Sullivan, the O'Sullivan's, the Gardner's. Um, and that's a different relationship. But those guys, the Brady's and the Gardner's, 
they're under contract, but they're also making some additional money by shooting photographs, portrait photographs, sort of on the side. And so um, they're all, the, the, those various streams of photographers are on the ground and getting those pictures made. And you can always tell them because look at the backdrop. If you have a dirt floor um, and a, an inexpensive uh, piece of canvas tacked up, um, more than likely you're in a photographer's tent somewhere on a, on a campsite. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Because I could go on all night asking a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to monopolize. Um, it's absolutely thrilling, really thrilling. And um, yeah, I'm a better person for having read your book. It's really great. Well, thank you so much. I do. Um, I, I have to thank Johns Hopkins. They've been so amazingly supportive. They took a chance um, because not a lot of uh, historians want to focus on these stories. Um, and so when I met editor Bob Brueger, um, he was like, yeah, he said, this is something that we should be doing, doing something with all of this. And uh, had it not been for him, uh, I would not be talking to you tonight. So, uh, and of course, there's a host of others who have pitched in along the way. Um, they often say that being an author is a lonely journey, but I, that's not my experience. I've had so many wonderful individuals along the way that have been part of all the projects. Um, so it's a, a tribute to all of them. Right. How great of them to commit to five volumes. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. Really, really, really thrilling. So everyone, okay, go, go out and buy your, buy your autographed copies. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do my uh, check here. Um, uh, go buy it. Um, you can get an autographed copy for you or a friend. Uh, the holidays are right around the corner. So. And, and keep me posted on whether more material surfaces. I'll be really fascinated to see. I will, and um, please uh, share my email address um, for those of you who have questions um, or looking for information. Um, my email. research, yeah, my research journey has been um, has uncovered a lot of books and other primary sources, and I'd be happy to do what I can to um, point you in the right direction. Oh, tell me your email again. It's ron.coddington at chronicle.com. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yes. That's right. Ron.coddington at chronicle.com. Okay. Yeah. And thank you. Absolutely fascinating. Oh, and let me just answer the person who wants it because we are recording this. Um, yes. Yes, it will be available. Thank you so much. <laughs> fascinating. Everybody enjoy your evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks Absolutely. for being here tonight. Take care. Good night. Take care. Thanks so much.